Sketching doesn't have to be scary, and it's kind of become my unofficial goal on this channel to prove that to you. So I'm back with some fall art loveliness that you can follow along with me. Today we're gonna sketch and paint a maple leaf, an acorn, a pumpkin, toadstool, a tree, a warm pie of some sort, a latte, a fall sweater, an apple, and a basket of flowers. Let's do it. I'm gonna be using Academy Cold Press watercolor paper. I'm gonna have a few pencils on hand. My recent most favorite drawing pen. I'm gonna link all the information below. And then of course my Art for Joystick watercolor palette and brushes. Again, everything will be linked below. Now you do you with this. If you feel a little nervous, you could map things out with pencil first, which I'm gonna start with. And then when you build up your confidence, you can go right to the pen. All right, let's get going on this maple leaf. I'm gonna start with a light line down the middle, and then I'm going to figure out some basic shapes, which really become diamonds. And these diamonds are gonna kind of connect at the base of each diamond at the base of the leaf. Now, by the time I've done the second one here, I think you can kind of see where I'm going. And this, I figured out to be a really great way to start a maple leaf. Cause I don't know if you're like me, but maple leaves just feel a little bit like, like your brain just doesn't know what to do with them. So then I start to go in with darker pencil line and edit the silhouette of what I've created. And follow along with any imagery of a maple leaf you'd like, or just follow along with me. A maple leaf has a lot of like ins and outs to the silhouette but it does essentially follow these three sections or three parts to the leaf. And yeah, ultimately do what you feel makes sense when it comes to editing the silhouette. Here's what I came up with. It's not perfect, but it definitely reads as a maple leaf. Now I'm going in with my most recent favorite brush pen. It's a black Kiritake AI. I did an entire video where I kind of came to this decision that this is my recent favorite. I'm gonna link that below if you'd like to check it out. And what I love about this pen, and I'm kind of really pushing the limits of it here, is that when you press harder, you get a really simple, simply made, thicker line. And of course, if you lift up and don't press as hard, you get a really, really, really thin, barely there line. And I love that undulation of thick line, thin line. Fantastic. Now with this kind of line and wash style, the line is the, the pencil and or the pen, and then the wash will eventually be the watercolor. With this style, there's a lot of different ways to go. I am gonna keep it simple when I start bringing in the watercolor washes, but know that you can come back in with more watercolor layers in between each drying and add and build up more emphasis and more dimension and more detail, and you can also add more detail with your pen. All right, heading into these acorns, basically two ovals, one smaller than the other on the right, and then they each have a little beret. That's the best way I can describe it. It's an upside down, it's like a frown. It's a very like gradual frown on top. And to me, it just looks like a beret with a little point on top, just like a beret. And I've just been saying beret too much, so I'll stop. I decided to add some kind of checkerboard or cross hatching texture, which feels kind of fun. And I have a little bit of extra like line work there on the left hand side. You might choose to just completely leave out the line work that I've added or go even further with it. A little bit of shine there on the bottom left. And then I'm gonna go ahead and go over top of the pencil on this other acorn here. Not sure if I wanna add that checkerboard cross hatching. I'm not sure how I feel about that. I actually kind of like it without, but you know, Again, this is fun. This is fall making art fun. So you do you, boo. Next up, we have the pumpkin. I'm going right in with the pen because I feel sufficiently warmed up, but if you wanna go in with a pencil, that is completely fine. Don't be hard on yourself. Here's the thing about a pumpkin. It kind of like reminds me of a tomato in a lot of ways, but with some linear indentations that kind of go vertically across the surface of the pumpkin. So I typically start out with like a tomato-like shape or even kind of a squat apple. And I make sure that there's some bumps along the top and the bottom of that silhouette. And then I connect the bumps with lines going vertically top to bottom. 
and there we go. Look at that. It's already starting to feel like a pumpkin. Then adding some thin vertical lines in the stem. I'm just thinking about a pumpkin stem. It's fuzzy and prickly a little bit, and it has all those ridges. And of course a curly cue because, you know, I'm making this a very iconic pumpkin, a perfect pumpkin with a curly cue and a leaf. Do pumpkins have leaves? I mean, I guess they do. Whatever, it looks cute. I'm feeling good, so I'm going back in straight up with the pen and a toadstool. Friends, if you're into toadstools, it's really straightforward and it's a refreshing thing to draw because it comes easily. It's like a little mountain, a little cap, a little beret without the point, if you will, and then you kind of create a similar shape underneath that cap, but in the opposite direction. And that creates that kind of dimension or that kind of umbrella feel. And then coming down from that would be your stem. And the stem, I like to make a little skinnier where it meets the cap and then getting thicker towards the bottom. And then of course, add these iconic circles, make them imperfect, make sure some of the circles are only seen partially. And that will make the cap of the mushroom feel like it's kind of curving over the edge and then add in those little linear moments radiating out from the base or from the top of the stem where it meets the base of the cap. And there you have it. Friends, these sketches are meant to be imperfect. The perspective's gonna be a little wonky. These are meant to be whimsical, stylized versions of everything that we're illustrating. I'm gonna add a few more little tiny toadstools here where you don't see the underside of the cap. So imagine they're tipped towards you a little bit more so that whole underside just disappears. And feel free to just create this kind of mushroom toadstool, whatever you wanna call it. They're a little easier to do because you don't have to worry about the perspective of seeing the underneath part of the cap. Just a little note here, this pen, let it dry for like 20 seconds and you're gonna be able to go over and erase right over top of it without any fear of smudging. Now, if you wanna be super, super extra careful, maybe let it sit for a good 10, 15 minutes, but honestly, I've had a lot of luck going right back in with an eraser and having just a beautiful, clean result. So yes, I'm definitely going to erase when we're all said and done here. And look at the grass that I added. I just went right over top, honestly, and had some weird intersections with the base or the stem of the mushrooms and the grass. But you know what? Once I get the paint on there, it's gonna work. All right, a simple tree. I used to call these cotton candy trees. So I basically make what looks like the head of a piece of broccoli. And it's just me bouncing my pen around in kind of a really soft conical shape and adding a trunk to this. And the trunk, I like to make sure the trunk has like three arms. It just, the asymmetry of three arms to the trunk feels, visually feels a lot better. And yeah, that's really the simplicity and beauty of a cotton candy tree. Going back in with a few more bouncy, squiggly, shapely maneuvers with my hand here. Maneuvers, oh wow, well I'm drawing, I'm maneuvering, whatever. But you can see I'm adding like layers of clusters of leaves, right? Some are coming to the front, some are pushing to the back and uh, you can definitely notice that separation where I start to add some more detail and it just really does feel like I'm bouncing around with my pen. It's a light touch and it, it's not heavy or overworked and I'm getting to the point where I'm actually starting to feel like it's overworked. So that's the point where my brain goes, get out, Chrissy, move on. With this line and wash, you always have to remember that the watercolor is gonna be a really amazing opportunity to add more detail. So you have to kind of pull yourself back and stop just before you think you should. All right, going in with the pie and I'm making the pie tin first, sketching that first, but making sure the top of the pie tin where it meets the crust is wavy because the crust is wavy. And then I'm going ahead and repeating that wavy line. Both of those wavy lines that sit on top of the pie crust tin are in kind of a soft smile shape. And then completing that with a little mountain or frown shape on top. And I'm adding a little bit of vertical linear detail to the crust of the pie. And then a few little ovals for the, what are those? 
pie vents or whatever so the pie doesn't like explode or I don't know what they're for, but they're cute, so I'm adding them. And they're kind of radiating around the center, around an invisible center. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Adding a little more texture at the top, that frown shape at the top. Just thinking that this might be, you know, a little bit of the crust from behind peeking up, or maybe this has got a little bit of a crumble on top. I don't know, I just felt like I needed some texture and I'm adding some vertical lines that are slightly facing inward, tapering slightly as you go from the top to the bottom of that pie tin. Little extra line at the bottom there. I felt like at the bottom of this illustration, it needed a little more weight visually. So that just second little line repeating kind of darken things up at the bottom there. It worked just perfectly. All right, time for the latte. I gotta tell you, I've never been great at creating these like stylized coffee cups from like Starbucks. It's just never been my thing, but I'm giving it a whirl. Two lines parallel and they start to taper towards the bottom. Little smile at the very bottom of the cup and then a smile at the top of the cup. And that's gonna give you pretty decent perspective. And then I'm adding just a soft kind of whipped cream, soft edge pyramid, if you will, and adding a few curved, like almost like J lines underneath each other in ascending size as I reach the top of the cup little cinnamon stick here on the right and you know it's all right I tried to like correct things on the right side here and it just kind of turned out weird but whatever we'll see we'll see what the watercolor does I don't know maybe I don't know maybe I'll sketch another one of these I kind of feel like I need a second go yeah whatever all right which one do you like let me know in comments which pumpkin spice latte illustration of mine do you like is it number one or number two i'm kind of partial to number two but honestly i feel like number one wasn't as bad as i initially thought let me know though and while you're at it are you enjoying this sketching fall themed fun just give the video a boop that's a like if you're feeling fall and festive i want to know you might be noticing as we switch from kind of the top down view of my camera to the side view, probably doing a lot of side view because I tend to hold my pencils and my pens almost perpendicular to the page. It's just something that I've done for as long as I can remember. But don't feel like you have to repeat the way that I hold a pencil or a pen. Do it the way that feels good in your hand on your body. Don't feel like you have to copy me. All right, we've got an apple coming up, friends. Basic, simple circle that you edit with a little indentation at the top and a little indentation at the bottom, a stem, a leaf, and a little shine on that. The shine can be like a teardrop with kind of a squared off edge and a pointed edge. All right, I've just been jonesing to do a sweater and I'm going in with pencil because I'm not feeling completely confident. Starting with a soft rectangle, at the top of the rectangle, I've got a little smiley shape and I'm extending on either side of that smiley shape down into the arms, which are basically longer rectangles. And then I'm gonna put in the sweater design, which is really the most important part of a whimsical sweater illustration. It's all about the design. I'm feeling good, I got the basic shape in there, so I'm going in with my pen. And I'm starting around the neckline with just a soft, like organic, scallopy, bumpy, little linear detail there. And I'm gonna repeat that on each of the sweater arm cuffs. Repetition is kind of important, I think, with the kind of fall sweater, because you're in a sweater like this, you're gonna see design details repeat. All right, repeating that organic kind of scallop line up top. And then I'm going right underneath it and adding in little circles. I think they're gonna become pumpkins, but they don't need to be overworked actual pumpkin shapes. As long as I paint them orange later, they'll be convincing. And then just continue on with another organic kind of smiley face that goes right across the chest of that sweater and repeat it for added detail. Going underneath with an actual scallop, but again, it's an imperfect scallop. You don't have to be super, super precious about it for this kind of illustration to be effective. Now, by all means, if you wanna do a tightened up, buttoned up version of what I'm doing here, I, I just go for it. And you know what? I wanna see it. You can reach out to me on Instagram and send me a photo in DMs or heck, post it for everyone to see. All right, adding a little more thickness to the line weight on the silhouette and also to the cuffs. I wanna make sure that the cuffs on the sweaters 
feel more prominent. And I always feel like these big kind of cozy fall or winter sweaters, the cuffs, the bottom hem, and the wrist hems are just super, super um, prominent and obvious. All right, going along the bottom of the sweater again with more organic, kind of wavy, slightly smiling curved shape. And again, that scallop, bumpy, imperfect detailing on top of that last line I created. And she's all looking pretty good. Remember, we're gonna erase all these pencil lines. Last but not least, and I'm most excited about this, I'm gonna do me a little wicker basket full of fall flowers. So much like my pie tin, just a little taller, I'm starting with that kind of shape that basically looks like a smile at the bottom and then a bumpy frown at the top. And then I'm creating this just organic shape along the top again that Ultimately, I will fill in with just some basic flower shapes. And I'm going right in after I created that big arc for the handle. I'm going in with leaves, I'm going in with spirals that could look like roses, um, teardrops that repeat around an invisible center that can look like dahlias. The point here is to just fill this organic empty space that you created with your silhouette on top of the basket with whatever feels like very iconic flower shapes to you. Maybe one of them you want to be a sunflower. So make sure your sunflower center is big and your sunflower petals are smaller. Or if you want a dahlia, you can make the petals longer and your center smaller. I'm going with a dahlia. When you're filling in kind of an organic area like this, where there's not a lot of rhyme or reason, just make sure that some of the flowers are bigger, some are smaller, and you're really making sure that the leaves that are poking out from around and behind the flowers are all going in a variety of directions. And then add a little bit of detail to your basket, a little cross hatching detail. Just make sure you follow the curve or the smile silhouette of your basket shape. All right, now it's time to go in with the eraser. I love this Stedler eraser. I'm gonna link it below if you're interested. It's got the little plastic shield that keeps your finger oils from messing around with it. I love it. All right, race this all down and we're gonna get ready to paint. I'm going in wet on dry, friends. Really wet on dry is one of my favorite techniques and one I use the most. I have a video all about wet on dry below. I'm gonna link it for you. I pulled out a brand new Art for Joy sake palette for this affair, this event, this fall fantastic fun. Okay, I'll stop. Um, and I sprayed everything down, of course, friends. And I went in and grabbed my peach, my fluorescent yellow, and then I'm going in with some red, wet on dry and just dabbing around that color, letting the moisture of the color alone start to move the pigment around on the paper. Now I'm grabbing some water and a little bit more peach so I can really start to move and groove and spread this color out. I am using my small cat's tongue brush. I like that it has the broad belly that holds a decent amount of paint and water, but also comes to this beautiful central point where I can really work in the nooks and the crannies. And I wish I would have added a little bit more silhouette editing along that top shaft of the maple leaf. I feel like it's a little awkward up there, but I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run with it. I'm gonna be okay with it and just kind of log it in my memory for the next time I go for a maple leaf. Dabbing in some pure red here with the tip of my brush, a little bit of the yellow as well. Everything now is damp, so this is officially wet on damp, a little bit of brown for that stem. But this is a beautiful point when your paper is damp like this, because any color that you add is going to be diffused easily. It's not going to explode on the page. It's going to softly start to spread. And you can see here, I'm adding those brown dots and dashes and dabs, but they don't look harsh because they're immediately diffusing because the paper underneath is damp. And honestly, now that I'm adding this detail, I'm not minding the imperfectness of my maple leaf silhouette nearly as much. And that's why it's so important not to judge the quality of your painting in the middle stages. And I actually have a video all about that to give yourself the margin to make decisions as you paint. I'm gonna link it below. It's a really important one. All right, going in with the ivory watercolor from my palette, wet on dry and just dabbing it in and blending it out and immediately going into that damp surface of the paper, 
with this gorgeous kind of burnt sienna like brown and i'm purposely not smooshing and washing it around i love the texture of just dabbing and a few flicks of the brush I love the texture that is creating so much that I'm already moving on to the pumpkin, grabbing my red and a little bit of pink with a lot of water on my brush and washing out that red that I initially added from the center. So it's staying pretty bold in the center and I'm washing it out and softening the color as I go. It was too soft, so I grab a little more red and yellow on my brush now to get more of that classic orange vibe but I love how the orange isn't the same. It's not the same thickness. It's not the same quality anywhere on this pumpkin. And that makes this illustration so darn interesting. Little bit of green after rinsing my brush, two different greens actually, use what you have, use what you love, and go into that stem. Now remember, the orange underneath is pretty wet. So if you're gonna bump those two colors, bump them subtly or else you could get a pretty decent explosion that you're gonna have to clean up. Moving on to the toadstool, I'm dabbing in some red and I'm gonna save the white on these white circles. Dabbing in the red and then going in with a damp brush and moving around, washing out the color from those dabs and moving it to fill all the other areas. If you just continue to add more red to your brush to fill in your toadstool cap, eventually it's going to be way too much paint. It's gonna start going everywhere and it's going to feel very out of control. So a few dabs and then a damp brush to spread it all around and spread it around in a way, let some of the color really run out from your brush so you get some bright areas, some sheer areas, and then some more intensely colored areas. I'm going into the underneath and to the stem with that ivory color, just washing that in really simply, and then going back without rinsing my brush with the red and dabbing in to re-intensify some areas, a little bit of purple into those intense red areas to even further push the shadowy feel in a few spots. And notice I'm holding my brush almost perpendicular. This is just, I don't know why I do this. It's so strange, but for me, it works. You figure out what works for you. I'm not saving the whites on these other two toadstools. Not really sure what I'm gonna do with them, but I'm going right over top with an orange wash, wet on dry, and then right into the damp with a wet on damp red, rinsing my brush a little bit, grabbing the peach for this leftmost toadstool cap, and again, not saving the whites, that would be just so tedious, and going in with a little red on one side and just letting kind of gravity and the air current do its thing and spread that color around. Then I'm dampening or wetting the area where the grass is and going right in with that bold emerald green from my palette, a little bit of the olive green from my palette, and notice I'm dabbing. I'm dabbing a, little, a few little flicks and where the pen lines kind of intersected the, the stems of my mushrooms where it did that awkwardly, I'm intensifying the color a little bit so that my awkward pen sketching decisions aren't as obvious. Going right into the tree, wet on dry with some of that olive green, going right in without rinsing with some fluorescent yellow and filling in. And notice as I go, as I add colors, I'm really kind of more perfectly filling in the shape that I've sketched. A little bit of that emerald green. Ooh, look at that. And you're starting to get a wet on damp situation with that emerald green as I work into the yellow and I'm going in with red. This is like early fall tree, friends. Part of the tree's turned, part of the tree's not. Back in that rightmost area with some fluorescent yellow and I'm just dabbing. And if I feel like my colors are getting muddy, which they're not yet, but if you feel like everything that you've already got on the page is starting to mix together and create kind of a dingy color, just give your brush a really good rinse. Going into the tree trunk with whatever's on my brush at this point, and then dabbing in some brown. If you have too much paint on your brush, just dab it off on a paper towel. I had a little too much here. Um, this is a really small space, this tree trunk, so a little too much. I should have dabbed a few more times. Rinse your brush. And we're gonna head into that pie crust, a little bit of peach, a little bit of brown, and then just work it in with the dampness of your brush. You don't need a lot of paint here. A Little bit more water. Going right into the pie tin. I decided I wanna make it red, it just feels right. So I'm gonna do a nice, moderately bold 
red strip of color from my brush and then rinse my brush slightly and use that moisture on my brush to blend out from top to bottom. So at the bottom, things are lighter than they are at the top of the pie tin. I just feel like this needed something. So I wanted to add some like steam coming up from the pie and yeah, so I'm adding that. Just a few kind of serpentine, really kind of soft serpentine shapes. Some are taller, some are not. And yeah, I think it's got a nice kind of steamy, hot, fresh from the oven vibe. Little bit of purple on my brush to dab into the leftmost side of that pie tin. Even a smidge of blue, because I really want that to feel shadowy there. And then along the bottom and a little bit, a few dabs underneath the pie crust, and that feels good. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and wet this apple down uh, because I want this red to start to move right away when I add it. Here we go, boom. Few little strokes on the left-hand side of the apple, and then add some water on your brush and blendy blend out to your heart's content. I am gonna try to save that little shine on the apple there so I don't have to scrub it out or lift it out or anything. Little bit of blue on my brush and I'm gonna dab and stroke on the left hand side just a little bit moving into the center to give some dimension and form to the apple. And that green leaf, a oh, little too much water on my brush. I'm going to blend that out and then drop a little bit of green into the leaf, making sure not to go too near the red of my apple or you know what could happen. So see how I'm lifting back towards the tip of the leaf to make sure it doesn't get too out of control with a wet on wet situation and mix with the red. A Little bit of deeper uh, emerald green at the base of that leaf and really this is all it needs. All right, it's time to go into these lattes. These are Starbucks lattes. So I'm just gonna go in with some green in that emblem and then rinse really well the brush, go in with the ivory for a little bit of shading and then into the foam, whipped cream, whatever it is, a little bit of ivory again and a smidge of brown just to make it feel like maybe there's toasted coconut on there or cinnamon, I don't know. I don't drink lattes so I don't really know what what the dealio is about them but they are cute they're fun to draw a little bit of that brown kind of for some shading right underneath the whipped cream where it meets the cup and for now i'm gonna leave that other cup go i don't know i don't feel like painting it right now so i'm going right into the sweater i've got some peach and brown but very little peach and brown on my brush I'm gonna grab some red and some yellow and I wanna immediately go in with a few simple dabs on those pumpkins. Be sure you don't have too much water on your brush or it's just gonna be pumpkin mayhem in that small space at the top of your sweater. And then go ahead and use that color in the bottom hem of your sweater and on the cuffs to repeat things. Grab a little brown, you don't need to rinse your brush this time. And again, repeat that brown on the cuffs, the bottom hem and even on the neckline. I'm gonna grab some green here. I just feel like a little bit of green in one of those little smiley shapes. Oh, maybe two. Okay, we're just gonna put it everywhere. I love this. I'm feeling this. I feel like this is like a Starbucks sweater. Like I feel like the sweater matches the pumpkin latte situation. Anywho, moving on. Little bit more orangey red detailing. I'm just kind of ad-libbing here at the very top of that bottom hem, letting that few dabs of color that I added bleed up into the damp areas. And oh yeah, I like the sweater. She's cozy. All right, a last bit of detail. Everything's still damp, so I'm going in with some brown and just dabbing that brown underneath the bottom most area of the design of the neckline. Now it started to bleed too much. So with a, a damp brush that's clean, barely damp brush, I'm lifting towards where I added that brown paint, kind of pushing it back from whence it came and dabbing on a paper towel ever so often to make sure I'm not kind of redepositing that paint that I want lifted back onto the painting. I love how lifting and removing paint actually reveals really beautiful, interesting textures that remain on the page sometimes. I just love 
that. All right, since I got this brown on my brush, I might as well go ahead in and we're going to finish this up with the basket. I'm going in with a pretty dark brown and then I'm gonna blendy blend it out with a clean-ish damp brush. Boom, blended. All right, and I'm gonna go right into my basket handle knowing that there's not a ton of water or pigment on my brush, I'm gonna have a lot more control. A little bit of green, a little bit of that fluorescent yellow, and I'm going to really rough in the greenery. I'm not gonna get too precious at all with the floral filler of this basket. Rinse your brush and let's get some red going. My brush wasn't perfectly rinsed there if you couldn't tell. Some yellow and let's get some flower love going on. Here we go, a few dabs. And the key here, friends, is you're working in a small space. Make sure you don't overload your brush. If you've got like a little bubble on your brush when you're about to hit the page, dab it. For the love of all things fall, dab that bubble away or it's gonna turn into a holy hot mess on your page. Now I'm kind of keeping the color palette like reds and oranges and greens. I'm gonna bring in a little bit of pink here just to like make sure things don't get crazy fall boring but you know, we're definitely keeping it warm. All right, at this point, let everything dry thoroughly. Depending on what climate you're in, that could take up to an hour or so, uh, but it's important for things to be dry at this point. And you can go back in, add some dashes, detailing, dots, cross hatching, stippling. I have a few videos here all about adding that kind of detailing with a brush pen. So I'm gonna link those below if you're curious about that. All right, a little bit of quiet time as I finish out the detailing here, friends. All right, we're gonna just pretend the wind caught up some of these basket leaves and petals and blew them around. So I'm going in with my pen and turning my smudges into little leaves and petals that have taken flight and all is well. Friends, head into comments, let me know, are you going to give this a try? Now, are you going to just sketch what I sketched or are there some other fall favorite icons that you have in mind? Go ahead into comments, let's have a conversation about it because maybe there's a couple more I need to draw. And while you're down there, go ahead, give this video a boop, that's a like. All right, hands down, the sweater is still my favorite. Pumpkin is number two, but the sweater is number one for sure. Friends, if you love this and you wanna try your hand out at some flowers in this style of sketching and watercolor wash, then watch this video next. And until next time, happy painting.